it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Al Solis uh, back to the Buck Institute of Education and here to uh, give our keynote this morning. This is pretty strange for me as well uh, to be back. And, and this morning, to be truthful, I didn't say, of course. The first thing Bob said is, hey, we need some help this morning. I said, jokingly, oh, you need more muffins? And he said, no, Emily, who's a friend of mine as well, which I kind of wondering what's happening with Emily. Uh, he says, no, she, something happened. And hopefully you could come in and, and, and do a keynote. I said, after a while, I was like, sure, we could totally do it. So if I talk really fast and trying to talk really slow, it's not me, it's the Red Bull talking. Uh, <laughs> so don't tell my wife, she t I told her I'm not gonna drink Red Bull anymore. Uh, so I started drinking coffee, I don't know if that's a good idea either. Uh, so that being said, this is my beautiful wife, this is one of our engagement photos. Uh, I don't technically really start until August, we're actually gonna take a cross-country train trip in July. Uh, we're gonna take 25 days, starting from Oakland where we both live now, we're gonna make all our way over to New York, going to through the north, and if you have any ideas from that train trip you've ever done it, please come and tell me, and we're gonna go make our way through the middle, uh, through uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, to make our way back here, and it'll be like 25 days. Uh, but here's my Twitter handle. I told my wife that I wouldn't be following email. It's one of those things when you're on vacation, trying not to disconnect with your significant other, and I told her that as well, but please tweet me some ideas. So, when I started at, at uh, High Takai, one of my first uh, things I do the first day of, of class, I put this on the, on, the, on the board. And I'd write, you know, one comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. And I'd ask my students, what is this? And they'd sit there kind of perplexed. And I said, no, what is this? Think I'm joking with them or whatnot. And then eventually someone raised their hand and they said, a million? I said, yes. And I tell them essentially that when I was in fourth grade, my fourth grade teacher, Miss Lujan, she basically called my father in uh, to do a parent-teacher conference and told my father that, you know, Al's falling behind in math. And if he falls too far behind, he's actually gonna have to repeat the fourth grade. So she gave him this textbook and said, during spring break, he's gonna have to do this textbook and hear the chapters and whatnot too before he falls behind. So then one night, my dad, after, after dinner, grabs the textbook, opens it up to a random page, points at a random number, which is this, and asks me that same question, what is this? And I sat there looking at it, He's like, what is this? And I didn't say anything. And eventually he's like, what is this? So I was getting frustrated, so I had to say something. So I said, one million, and he said, stop. I was like, stop. I was about to say one million, zero hundred thousands, zero ten thousands, zero thousands, zero hundred, zero tens, and zero. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at a childhood tragedy. <laughs> no, so, so essentially, I was making, I was like, that's it? I was making it so much more complicated than it actually was. But I had to say something, I had to do something for my dad to give me feedback at that particular moment. At that moment, math became my strongest subject. At that moment, math became really easy for me to the point where I graduated top of my class in, well, in high school and also in engineering as well, and where I taught actually math and physics at High Tech High. So it's kind of strange how that particular moment really kind of shaped my life. And the point that actually brought me to BIE as well to kind of show my street cred of, of some of the things I did at BIE, this is from a, another presentation, but you know, one of those things I got to work on as well was like the, the PBL 101 workbook. And this was, a, this was back in 2011, it's funny, Gina Ola Bonaga is like one of the first one to comment it. It's not real until you post it on Facebook and you get enough likes, right? So <laughs> I have it there and I go, this is my first book I got to work on with my friends and I have, it has ISBN number and everything. So to kind of go from you know, that particular moment with my father where I'm actually working on books and doing stuff for education was a big thing too. And most importantly, the thing that I'm most proud of in education too, what I worked on as well, if you don't know it already, is the tube brick. The tube brick, if you haven't, you, if you haven't done the tube, go to tubebrick.com. And tubebrick.com is where you can work on the driving questions or whatnot too. And if some of you don't know it, if you go to tubebrick.com, you actually download it in Spanish. I have people translating it in other languages as well and there's an edible version of it if you want your kids to work on it. So enough about that from a BIE standpoint. So day two, here come my students. After that million thing happening, day two, I put this on the board with my students. Because here I was now at high tech high, and I had to challenge these kids. And is it important for them to know that one plus one equals two? Yeah, but I put that on the board. I think to myself, all right, how could I challenge them even more? So I said, well, when does one plus one not equal two? I said, when does one plus one not equal two to my students? 
And they sit there for a while, perplexed again, like trying to understand, like, why is this guy asking us again? When is one plus one not equal to two? Some of you might know it already. There's actually millions of ways to think about vectors and different things too. Well, a lot of it is when you put numbers to it and you put units. Once you start applying those units to something, right? Because I'm also teaching math and physics to the same kids, right? Physics became the math lab that they never had. So now that I'm applying these things with the students, now I'm saying to myself, okay, we need to apply the math. We need to apply the physics into something. And like Bob said, you know, my background has been from project to project to project, from uh, Anderson Consulting uh, to from my college days, my senior design projects. You know, at the time, when I started Hayataka, I didn't have the, the, the fancy gold standard PBL. No one really understood, like, what is all that stuff, you know? But I did have a lot of that stuff, which is, you know, mathematical modeling, the engineering design process, you know, uh, all of that, scientific inquiry. So all of those kind of things are what I kind of tapped into, kind of way that it was all structured. So a lot of things, when I started, it was something about, okay, am I gonna start from scratch? Am I gonna re-engineer the wheel? Like start, uh, so I said to myself, well, how am I gonna innovate something brand new? So the thing that I, you know, people think about, I wanna talk about uh, innovation for the most part, but sometimes I disappoint them because I really wanna talk about renovation. Renovation is, is something that was big for me, and that's how I started. A lot of times when I, my first thing, project I ever did was renovating an existing project. And I think that really helped me, because I was overwhelmed. I was, it was my first year teaching, I was at a school called High Tech High, I was like, what's going on here? What was I gonna do? And one thing I tapped into were existing projects. So the first project I did was uh, one that I was driving to school, and I saw these urban trees, they call them, on the side of the street. And it was the Port of San Diego were doing these, these projects since for artists. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. So I went to the website, they had wind load calculations, they had all the stuff that the artists were doing, and it was real. I said, you know, I could do something like that and adjust it and renovate it for my classroom. And the cool thing was is that uh, at the time, I, I called them up and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to do this for my classroom, you know, would you really be interested in having my students look at stuff? They're like, wait a minute, like you're having your kids do this as a project in school? I said, you know what, we have, all these maquettes or models at our site right now with artists submitted, it would be great for your students to see all of that. I was like, that's a great idea. You know, so I went over there and my students got to visit the, uh, at the Port of San Diego where 200 of these maquettes or models were all placed before they even did the project. So I didn't even know I was doing some of that entry event or that need to know for my students right before it even started. They had that end in mind right off the bat. They saw all the stuff that the artists were doing to the point when they were actually designing their own. And I didn't have that much money, even though it's called high tech high. We made these out of barbecue sticks. They had little boskers that are cutting it all up and, and gluing all these together. We did geometry and, and the physics behind the, the calculations and whatnot. I had little terracotta pots in the bottom. As I told the kids the first time I'd be handing out pot in class. <laughs> so, so that was one of those things where here are my students doing all these things. And at the same time, too, you know, once I told the Port of San Diego, hey, my students did all this. The staff got involved. They chose out of all the, the maquettes which ones they liked. And the city council and the people who were judging it wanted to come out and see what the students were doing. It was really interesting. So they, we actually set it up as more of a gallery walk. And, and the students create little uh, artist boards of what they did. I wish they were standing by it. I could, if I could renovate it again, I wish the students were standing by it. Kind of like the kinetic art conundrum video, if you haven't seen that with Edgetopia. Very similar. I think they kind of renovated my project, but it's all right. I love them. The, uh, so here's this thing where, the, where she's actually the city council person walking around and judging them. And the cool thing was they got the maquettes, and the students saw them. They were looking at them from above. They pulled the maquettes like this, and the students were like, ask, why are you looking at that way? Because because that's where people are gonna see it, that vantage point. And we never even thought about that and how you're gonna experience the art piece. And the cool thing was that the students, the, the girls who, this was the one, the spinning uh, spirals, they brought them over to their board meeting. And at the board meeting, these, these two girls, uh, they went out there and during a board meeting, I said, like, who's gonna go to the, the Port of San Diego meeting uh, or, or, or whatnot? And they had some kind of issue. So there were like 200 people that were there at this meeting. And I said, oh my gosh. And the girls were like, we got this. Mr. Solis, they went up there, did the presentation, uh, they, they knocked it out of the park, and I went up on the mic, I was like, you know, it'd be nice if they actually got to build this thing. And, and, and they really talked about it, really allowing us to try to build it, which became a whole other dramatic story as well. But the, the long story is, after that, they dedicated one of those trees to a student who would propose it, and they started building those for the students as they went forward. So it was something really cool uh, moving forward, to think about renovating something that's out there. Like for example, there's this uh, network for teaching entrepreneurship. 
It's also in the Bay Area, different chapters. If you're trying to do something for like a business plan, have your kids do something like that, there are organizations that have a lot of the material and curriculum already. They have it all there. And if some of you don't know it, you can go to PBLU, because at PBLU, there's things called BizWorld that's on, on, on the site. So BizWorld is a, a place where elementary kids make a fictitious company and they create friendship bracelets or whatnot. But all the material is there. You could basically just kind of renovate it for your own needs and it's all aligned to all different standards or whatnot. And don't, don't think that just because it's elementary, you can't use it in other areas like middle school and, and, and in high school. Uh, and it's all good for all of them. You know, a lot of people are doing spoken word. word. Spoken word events, they're all happening all over, uh, uh, all over Oakland. Uh, and that's something to even tap into also. You know, spoken word events that are already out there. How do you promote it where the students are doing it at the same time and, and you get to use their marketing kind of juice, kind of like the Port of San Diego did. It's like, wow, your students are doing it, we can market them too and get more people there to your event. So I didn't, if you want to look at an existing project very similar to it, on PBU, it's the Resilience Cafe. So the Resilience Cafe is one where students talk about civil rights, but they, they do spoken, spoken word piece as well. So that was one of the students from uh, my friend Katie Staff who put that project together for the Resilience Cafe. And it was interesting that, uh, I think it was just last week, John Larmer forwarded me an email where, you know, you put these projects out there, you're not quite sure what's gonna happen. And there was a teacher who did that project with her students. And, it was, and, they, and they've been teaching for the last 17 years and they, they just came across the Resilience uh, Cafe and they did that project with their students. They were like, it was one of the most, you know, powerful moments in, in their teaching career. And it, was, and it was kind of the twilight too, because they were retiring at the time and they were so happy to do something like that with their students uh, before they left and before they retired. So something to take a look at, all the PBU projects, something that you could renovate that's already out there. One thing to also renovate is how we look at 21st century competencies as well. I think it's very important. I know, I know that we're also changing the language here, success skills, right? That's something that's changed for the, the gold standard. Uh, I'm on the board for uh, E3, and, and E3, what they focus on, one of the things is that, sorry if you can't really see it, they look at uh, 21st century skills and leveraging that for at-risk youth. So instead of kind of, we, we kind of mentioned now, it's, it's essentially thinking about how to flip street smarts and convert that into something they could use in the classroom already. Think of it as an asset model with your students, where they're actually like collaborating already, they're communicating, they're very creative. How can we tap into that as being an asset for them that they already do in their, in their current lives? Like for example, if you have a student, you might say, wow, you know, like if she's taking care of her brothers and sisters, she's like handling the phone stuff, doing, you know, preparing dinner, they're great project managers. You know, they know how to kind of handle whatnot and handle teams and handle individuals. So how can we tap into that to kind of make that life experience into actual 21st century skill? So that's something that uh, we've always talked about and where essentially we tap into that shift or looking at that asset and how do we create student programs and teacher programs to help them leverage those types of things. So within those programs, you know, these students are, are trying to figure that all out, trying to say, hey, I come to the table with something. Like for, and and they, right now they're doing it out of, out of the core time. It's, they're basically doing it after school and some of these programs creating digital storytelling, um, but they chip away at it and talk about really serious issues. And one thing I wanna highlight is my, my friend Ashanti. He's the gentleman there with the, with the longer braids. But Ashanti, he's part of the Ever Forward Club. He's a vice principal in Oakland. And he just had a, he was featured, his, his uh, Ever Forward program, it's a mentoring program, was just featured in a documentary at the Sundance uh, Film Festival. So it was called uh, The Mask You Wear. And it was Gavin Newsom's wife was putting together another documentary and that came through, uh, and, and his program was featured in that. And essentially it was trying to get young men and women just coming together and talking about their issues. And it was something like putting down the mask. And there was something about helping these at-risk youths to kind of, uh, kind of just uh, uh, look to each other for support. And, and it's really, Kind of, you know, if you look at what's happening now with all the, the, the youth now that we're losing uh, to either violence uh, and not to make summer mode, just kind of like the issues that have been happening lately in regards to um, the protests and look what just happened recently in, in, in South Carolina. So how, how can you look at individuals and having them talk about these particular issues before everything boils over? So that's something that within his program is having students try to talk about earlier on. How do we use them to communicate that? How can we collaborate together to kind of support each other when times get tough? How can we open up and put down the mask and finally like cry in for each other and talk about these tough issues? So that's something that to really think about of really tapping into the, the students who always thought themselves as being a deficit. How can we pull these assets from them and to make them feel kind of wanted in, in the classroom or even it's out of school time in after school programs. So, I'll move on, I know it's a, a sad subject. 
So another thing to look on is how do we look at technology? How do we renovate the existing uh, technology? I know that a lot of times when, when, when you think about technology, I'm a big proponent of technology, uh, you know, at, at the times you think about, you know, someone's really happy and, and now we're introducing this technology and we wanted it to, to, to fulfill a need and fulfill a problem, well, at times, if you force them to use technology, the technology becomes a problem because they don't know what to do with it, and all of a sudden, they're kind of stuck with that. So a lot of times, they get either sad or they're indifferent about it. So a lot of times, you think about, well, for it to become technology, it should satisfy a need. Look at that. What is it going to be helping you within your class? So for example, if they're asking you to do this gold standard PBL, like, OK, they're asking me to do this. What technology could help me to where, you know, if I use that technology, I'm going to be happier? Right? So just for a, a simple thing of, I know that critical thinking is a big asset, right? Critical thinking is something they want you to start doing with your students and going through exercises. So for example, there was this article, this was about the, uh, when the students, the children, uh, were crossing the border and they were all in Florida and they were doing these rocket dockets to help process these students or whatnot. There was this, you, this article about that and let's say you wanted to bring that, that, you know, these conversations with your students. Well, critical thinking kind of also assumes the fact that comprehension is there, that they understand the issue, like what's happening or whatnot. So one thing, to how, how can we help our students? Here are our students, here's you, trying to have them understand this really complicated issue. And this end here, if you haven't used it already, the show of hands, has anyone heard of Nucella? Nucella? So Nucella is a great site where they basically put articles. And for example, here's one. I found that. Here's the rocket dockets here. And they have that article, and they step it through five different reading levels. So here's a situation where technology, now you're having your kids wanting them to have this conversation about what's happening in Florida with all these students. But that's a pretty tough conversation. They don't even understand what the issue is. So ha using articles like this, and there's a bunch of other ones too. When you go to their site, you know, they also have uh, war and peace, science, money, law, health, and arts. So there's other domains within that site that you could step through. So that's something to not even think about also, kind of how do we use technology? That's one simple example of, of we're asking kids to do critical thinking. Well, they don't even understand what's going on. How can I help them look at something or read something to help them comprehend the actual issue? Here's something like Nusella. So think about, like, look at technology that way. What is the need that it's going to satisfy or help you with before it becomes technology in your class? So the next one is how do we look at Renovating assessments, assessments as well. Beyond like the, you know, it, it, I still did quizzes, I still did exams, I still did all those things in my class. People think that it was just projects all the time. No, I still did all those things still in my classroom. But what else did we do? And, and one time, uh, this gentleman, Larry Bach, uh, Larry Bach, when I was out of the class, my last year at High Tech High, I focused on dissemination. And Larry Bach came to High Tech High and said, hey, you know, I really want to do these uh, science festival in San Diego. And all the folks at Hyde Takai were sitting around in, in, at the table. And he was like, you know, I want to do you know, the science festival. It's this, uh, this big day in Balboa Park in San Diego. You know, and, and I also, it would be great if I did some kind of like AIDS quilt kind of project that, that the kids could showcase something that they've learned in their class. So I kind of sat there. And I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. And, and I talked to him and said, hey, you know, I have these uh, you know, electronic board games that my kids did for the last five years of my class where they got a shirt box and some circuits from Radio Shack. Sorry, Radio Shack, that you're closing. Uh, and, and so Radio Shack uh, parts or whatnot, and my teaching partner would do all the content on the top, and, and I would work on all the circuitry underneath, you know, and, and, they, and they had all this stuff. And, I, and in my head, I say, oh, you know, I know how to price it out. I knew the, the shirt box. I knew all the components. I could say, you know, here's this thing. And, and, and Larry Bach was like, oh, that's a really cool idea. I said, well, how much does that cost? Well, I could, people could do it for like $8 to $10 a box, something like that. They could make these things. And he's like, wow. So he went off and found some monies from this uh, generous family. And, and I said, wow. And he emailed me. I said, well, who's going to run that project? He's like, you are. And I was like, me? I was like, I haven't run that before. I've done that with other teachers. So basically, he's like, he's one of those people like you just like, wow, you know? It's like, it's like Bob, like, hey, do a keynote this morning. And I actually know you're standing on, on the stage and doing a keynote. And so here's uh, Larry Bach. And all of a sudden now, I'm teaching this half-day workshop with 16 teachers from five different districts in San Diego how to do this thing. And they weren't even, they didn't know anything about electronics. So they had to first try to do it themselves and get past the technical hump 
about how they could do it. So we actually did the project in my class, like part of it, and they could figure out whatever content they want on top. And it was kind of scary. It was basically, all right, here we gave them a bunch of boxes. We gave them 20 each. I said, all right, see you in three months. And we didn't know what was going to happen. And so I was really nervous about it. So we came back. It was in, it was in April. And it was all from all levels, from digestive system, teachers using it for AP, biology, they're using it for students in elementary, of, of just working, whatever content they wanted on top. Once they got past the technology piece, they're like, oh, this is really easy. They taught it to their students, and they, created, they were very creative on all the stuff uh, on, on, this, on the surface, whatever content they wanted. So the, from an exhibition standpoint, the kids were really focused on it and asked them, well, why, you know, why are you so excited about doing this? Well, because we're going to present it at Balboa Park. It's going to be out there for the real audience to interact with as well. So it was funny. So I, I go to the park, because I was basically going to be an audience member, and Larry Bach asked him, I go, well, how many people did you, uh, what's the word, permit for in Balboa Park to have, this, to have this event? He's like, oh, I did about, like, you know, I don't know, 12,000 people. I said, wow, that's a lot of people. You know? So I get there, 50,000 people are there. 50,000 people. And now it's not just for this. It was about other stuff that was happening, but they were all coming to the heart of, of the event, and they were walking through this. And, it was, and operation is very generational. Everyone was playing it. And no matter what age you were, like, wow, and they were learning, and the kids were, like, you know, kind of buzzing around and going through all the content. So it was insane. The exhibition, the kind of having it out there for people to see, the performance assessment aspect of it was huge for these kids and for these teachers, too, because they were proud of what the students were doing and the commitment that they had. So just to kind of go a little further on it, it was really cool is that after this in San Diego, uh, Larry Bach uh, went on and, and I heard something, this was like the year after, uh, I heard something about President Obama talking about some kind of uh, science, uh, science fair, he called it. And at the time, no one really used that kind of language to Larry. And I, asked, I texted Larry, I was like, hey, you know, uh, was, is Obama talking about you in the White House? He's like, he goes, I don't know, but I'm gonna pretend he was. And, <laughs> So I went back and I looked at that, at that newspaper, and there's Larry Bach, like Forrest Gump, standing behind President Obama. <laughs> so, so here he is. I'm like, Larry, that's you behind him. So if you haven't heard about it, it's the US Engineering and Science Festival that happens in, in, on the National Mall. So the following year, there were 750,000 people were involved. 500,000 were at the event, 250,000 for the satellite events. People want to showcase what they're learning. People want to do stuff like the maker movement, all of that. People want to showcase from a performance assessment all the work that the students are doing. All right? so, so one of the big things is as you start to renovate and start to create all these things, like some of you are designing, some of you are, are new to, to the PBO world today, but some of you have been designing a lot of projects. One thing I told a lot of my teachers is we got to start curating. How do we curate our work, our students' work and your own work? Because yeah, I think it's important for us kind of as we go for other people to kind of uh, Renovate our projects. Now, one thing I tell them before, I go, they say, hey, hey Al, can, you know, can we do one of your projects go, only under one condition that you make it better? You, know, you make it better. So, something to be said about this is kind of old, I kind of get embarrassed now, but this is since 2004. My website is still up. Uh, if you go to alfredsolis.com, don't worry, it's free. Just go to alfredsolis.com, click on a couple of ba banner ads, uh, you'll be okay. The, so you go to my site, and all my projects are still there. And it's funny, because I get notifications how many people are still going to my site and, and trying to do the project. I still get emails today randomly, teachers saying, hey, I did this one. I did this project. Do you have any more? You know, do you, you know that project 15 years ago? <laughs> could you, could you, you know, dust off your materials and, and email it to me? So but people, for example, they go to my site, and there's this one, Extreme uh, Sports, where students uh, would create a bungee cord out of uh, rubber bands, and they would protect an egg, uh, and my students would create uh, bungee cords and, and, and drop an egg and I'd stand up on this, this huge um, uh, mechanized ladder and we'd drop these eggs and I said it was extreme if you got within a foot from the ground and, and, the, and your egg survived or whatnot. And it had students uh, also creating wind chimes. They had to do the math in order to understand, understand the notes uh, and use this electrical conduit that they were cutting and creating wind chimes. Uh, I, I actually learned some of that from uh, when I went to Michael's and they had a like, wealth of knowledge in Michaels in regards to like, what to use and what not to use and creating the wind chime. But I also was really uh, trying to use uh, really cheap products from Home Depot and use electrical conduit. It only cost a dollar. So it only cost a dollar and you have to have a hacksaw. Uh, so you don't mind having your kids wield a hacksaw and then they cut these, these pipes and they put together a wind chime. And it had all the, the notes from a math perspective and putting it all together. 
So I, I say these things of, of renovating because you never know. You know, you're, you're trying to do, you know, these rubber band projects. You know, you're trying to do stuff that musical notes using mathematics because you never know what's going to happen. For example, so President Obama visited uh, this school called uh, Maynard New Tech. It was in, it's in Austin. And my friend Steve Zipkis started that school. And at the time, it was, it was funny because, you know, I didn't think much about it. It was my second year at High Tech High, and he's like, hey, he, I, I presented one time, and he's like, hey, I'd like you to help me start a school. And I didn't know what it was. I was like, are you crazy? I'm here at High Tech High. I'm not going to leave High Tech High. He's like, well, I want to start a school. Then later on, I found out that it was made a new tech that he started. So then President Obama was just there. Uh, I think last year, I believe, he, President Obama was there. So I'm not saying they did my projects, <laughs> but they might have renovated one of my projects, which is really cool, uh, kind of thinking about that. So. It's something I think about quite a bit. Uh, so if you do that, you know, President Obama might actually, if you curate your project, President Obama might talk about it one time in your class. So, so, and then once you start curating it, right, and you do a project, and at times, you know, it's funny when teachers say, well, when I do this project, I'm never going to, I have my curriculum for the, you know, forever, and I have to do it ever again. But every year, it changes. You should renovate your, your project from year to year. So, you know, for example, my, one of my first years, you know, I, I really wanted to innovate, and, and, I, and all I had as a, uh, an asset was all these tables, and I said, what am I going to do? I want to teach uh, math, I want to teach uh, momentum and energies, and I saw all these tables, and I kind of gave away the joke here, but at the time, I thought about uh, Donald Duck in Math and Magic Land, and if you ever watched that Donald Duck in Math and Magic Land, it, Donald Duck, what does Donald Duck do? He plays pool. Well, I gave the joke away. But <laughs> he basically, Donald Duck plays pool. So I, I, I thought about how can I have my kids make little pool tables, you know, have a little bit of felt. They made uh, the pool balls out of, out of golf balls that they got uh, donated from a, a driving range. And they created all the bumpers. And they had to do all the analysis. I had to pretty out, which figure out I had these uh, PVC tubes where the students would roll the uh, golf balls down and calculate the amount of energy that was lost. Uh, now, I don't mean to be geeking out on science, but that was some of the things that they did, which, you know, they were learning stuff. And, and my first year, I did it. You know, this student came over, and he put a, this six-by-nine piece of board on top of the table and said, Mr. Stoltz, I'm going to build a full-scale pool table. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, this is crazy. And what did all the other students say? I want to do the same thing. So people knew who were in my class, who were students from my class, because they had the biggest biceps. And they were constantly carrying these pool tables around. And you know, we basically ended it, we exhibited from having um, a pool tournament at the end or whatnot. And so the following year, I said, you know, what am I going to do? The following year, then, I created a, changed the requirements. I said, I want it to be small. I gave them a, a, a two by three piece of wood. And now they had to raise it off of the table, but they needed to have a ball return system as well. So that created some actually challenges as well, because I had to, if I renovate it again. But it's you know, one of those things where I made some adjustments. Quick story on this, I got a little bit of time. Uh, after I did this project, and, and the kids were working on this, it was funny because uh, we had like, uh, these visitors who were coming by. And, and these people came by and said, hey, you know, are your kids working on this uh, on Wednesday? And I said, oh, you know, yeah, they're working on this on Wednesday because my kids were in project mode. They were sawing, they are building all this stuff, putting together all their, 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 their pool tables. I said, yes, they're doing this on Wednesday. So that was on a Monday. These two women, they came back again on Tuesday with like eight other people. And we're like, are you doing this on Wednesday? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this. Man, there's a lot of you here. You guys like, she goes, yeah, we're just being thorough because we want to videotape you or whatnot. I go, oh, this is, that's cool. So I, I told my students, like, it's not unusual for people I had to kind to videotape, people walking around. So then here comes Wednesday. And you know something important is happening because you start waxing the floor in the school. You know, when they start waxing the floor in the school, you realize, like, okay, you know, something's happening. Someone really important's coming. And at the time, I, and, and Larry Rosenstock, who was one of the, found, the founder of Hi he, you know, he was mentioning how there's some pe important people coming to the school and all that, and he can not really talk about it. So I went up to him and said, hey, you know, there's a camera crew coming in to, to, do, uh, to shoot in my class. Is it, they're going to get in the way. He looked at me and says, you're not going to believe it. Just do your thing. And so then we're all getting excited. So all the stuff, the kids are all saying they're all working. And my dean of students is walking down the hallway. And, and 20 seconds before the, the, peop, the guests show up, I go to my uh, dean of students, Marcus, and I said, you got to tell me, man, who's going to show up? Like, who is this? He's like, well, it's Bill and Melinda Gates and Oprah. <laughs> and I was like, oh? <laughs> I was like, 
let's do this. And I ran in. <laughs> And, and here they come, you know, like 20 people, and it's Bill and Melinda Gates and Oprah Winfrey, and they had two camera crews. They walk in, and it was, it was insane. They walk into the class, the kids are, you know, working, they have security teams, and, and you can't tell who they are, because they're the cameramen, you don't know what's happening. And they were like, you're asking the kids a bunch of questions. It took Oprah a while to realize that I was the teacher, you know? <laughs> and, and I was, uh, I didn't shave, it was horrible. And, and Oprah did her thing, I said, Oprah was like, and pool is cool. You know, and, and it was really cool. So again, I gotta tell you that if you renovate your projects, Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey <laughs> will visit your classroom. I'll tweet it right now and let her know that. So again, I know I kind of covered a lot and, and bear with me, this is a, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be back with BIE, which I love BIE so much. But I want to go back to that my, one of my first slides with my, with my beautiful wife and, and say, like, you know, I'm taking July as a break. I'm going to go on a 25-day uh, uh, cross-country train trip with my wife. And, and it's really important for us to recharge. It's really important for us to recharge. And I don't know about you, and I forget now how I have vacation time and, and whatever that means anymore. And vacationing is so much different than disconnecting nowadays. And you can't really disconnect and really truly disconnect uh, from everything, email or whatnot too. So education gets, you know, get reminded in regards to how much time we need. And I tell people like, you know what? It's not, you're, run, you're not running out of gas. Think of yourself as more of a hybrid car. <laughs> you have to put on the brakes sometimes to recharge because that's how hybrid cars recharge, right? So don't give up. You know, I know it's, some of you might be overwhelmed. There's so much going on. You're like, what did the guy just say today? I'm like crazy, you know? And, and, and education, I just remember, it's, it's, it's tough. We chose to be here. It's a vocation. It's a calling. I love being here, too. And it, it never gets, it's not, it's not easy, but let's do it together. We can work it out together. So I know that Stephen Ritz, he says his, his, I don't know if you use your I am possible and, and kind of thing too, he usually does. Uh, you know, it's one of those cheesy things where, you know, are you an American or American, right? <laughs> it's one of those, those, those moments like that, because I want you to know, I'm a Philippine yes. Not a Filipino. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.